We are up to chapter 5, Mishnah number 20. Kol machlokas shehil Hashem Shemayim, any dispute that is for the sake of heaven, sofo lehiskayim, in the end, it will endure. V'she'ein l'shem Shemayim, but a dispute that is not for the sake of heaven, ein sofa lehiskayim, it will not, in the end, endure. So there's two kinds of disputes, one that is for the sake of heaven, that will endure, one that is not for the sake of heaven, that will not endure. And now the Mishnah proceeds to tell us an example, the prototype of these two kinds of arguments. What is an example of a dispute that is for the sake of heaven? This is the dispute of the academies of Hill and Shammai. As we know, at the turn of the millennium, the academy was split into two. We have one academy that was founded by Hillel, the Nasi, the president of the Sanhedrin, and one academy that was founded by his sparring mate, by his friend and disputant, Shammai. And for about a hundred years, the Jewish academy was split into two until they were reunited in Yavne. But for about a hundred years, there were very serious disagreements between these two camps. But it was an example of a dispute for the sake of heaven. They were both arguing for the sake of heaven. And that's the good kind of dispute that will eventually endure. And an example of a dispute that is not for the sake of heaven, Zu Machlokas Korach V'chaladaso. This is the dispute of Korach, Moshe's first cousin, and all of his assembly. In the book of Numbers, Moshe faces a mutiny. Moshe faces a rebellion. Moshe faces an insurrection where Korach questions Moshe's legitimacy and eventually it ends very poorly for Korach and all his co-conspirators. They are swallowed up and they, there's a fire that attached them and Moshe and Aaron's legitimacy is firmly established for all. That dispute of Korach and his henchmen, Korach and his co-conspirators, is an example of a dispute not for the sake of heaven. Okay, so we're talking about disputes here, arguments, disagreements, and we're told there's a good kind of disagreement and there's a bad kind of disagreement. What does it mean to have a dispute for the sake of heaven? So the commentaries tell us that people are different and people have different ways of seeing things and people's minds work in different ways. And two people, when they are in the pursuit of the same goal, Sometimes they have different prescriptions for how to get there. They have different ideas of how to navigate a given situation. If both are trying to find the same answer, both are trying to arrive at the same conclusion, both are seeking the truth, they just have different ways of getting there. That's an example of dispute for the sake of heaven. It's not because they have skin of the game. They have a horse in the fight. It's not an ad hominem attack. They're trying to find out what's right. They're trying to come to the truth. Now, Korach, he was totally selfish. What he wanted is power. He wanted to reign. He wanted to rule. He had envy motivating him. Now, he actually framed it as him fighting for the public. It's almost like a politician. A politician says, I'm fighting for you. I'm on your side. I'm on your team. In truth, the politician wants power. Politician wants control. The politician wants votes. But they frame it as they're helping everyone else. And it's not necessarily a dispute for the sake of heaven. Korach went around and tried to rile up the masses to go against Moshe. And he told them, oh, I'm doing this for you. Moshe is corrupt. It's not just Moshe who's special. We're all special. Moshe's no better than you and me. Moshe's part of the elite. He's part of the group of people who just wants to dominate us. That's what Korach was saying, but truthfully, all Korach actually wanted was power himself. He was simply power hungry and envious of Moshe, and that led him towards this dispute. It was not for the sake of heaven. Now, I think it's interesting just to begin this Mishnah, the Mishnah does not say categorically that dispute, disagreement is bad. When we're 
pursuing here, what we're seeking here, is not monochromatic uniformity. In fact, we believe that there are 12 tribes. And we're told in the sources that in heaven, there are 12 gates, and prayer can enter one of these 12 different gates. Meaning that there's different kinds of prayers and there's different ways to connect to God. 12 tribes, 12 different general philosophies of how to connect with the Almighty. Each tribe has its own unique way of doing it. Moreover, our sages tell us that Sinai was not a uniform experience. To the contrary, there were 600,000 souls present at Sinai, and there were 600,000 unique, distinct revelations. Each individual soul received a bespoke, tailored revelation from God. Our ideal world is not this, oh, quiet consensus, no one arguing, everyone just accept what everyone else does. That is not the Jewish ideal. We have a principle in the Talmud called Elu Ve'elu. These and these. When there's a dispute, Hillel and Shammai, these and these, Elu Ve'elu, these and these are both the Word of God. They're both true. They're both Torah. In our world, only one of them could be the Halacha. But in the spiritual world, they are both indeed true. In our world, you know, there are many different kinds of Jews, many different kinds of legitimate streams of Judaism, so long as they are all pursuing truth, so long as they're all accepting of the 13 principles of faith, so long as they are all fastidiously adhering to halacha, you have one group that favors this kind of worship, one group that favors that kind of worship, one that makes an emphasis of Torah study more than anything else, and one that makes an emphasis of kindness more than anything else, and one that makes an emphasis of prayer more than anything else. But all of them are observing the halacha. All of them are in line with the general, so to speak, guardrails of the religion, and everyone has to find their unique voice. Everyone has to find their unique niche within it. When we start our prayer, the Amidah prayer, We say the God of Abraham, Elokei Avraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov. Now, we are always very careful about not adding too many words. So you could have simplified this. You could have said the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Elokei Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. But that's not what it says. It says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Why are we adding the unnecessary words? We could have simply said, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Instead, we're saying the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God God of Jacob. So the commentaries explain that these were unique relationships. Abraham, of course, developed a relationship with God, the God of Abraham. Isaac did not say, let me just follow what Abraham did. I'll just do the same thing. Isaac worked to develop his own unique way of relating to the Almighty, his own unique way of connecting to God. And he developed his own way, and that's the guide of Isaac. Jacob the same way. He too did not subsist with simply just copying, mimicking what his parents and grandparents did. He developed his own way of doing it. We believe everyone is unique and individual, And it's okay to be different. And Isaac and Abraham were almost opposites, but they were both in pursuit of truth, both seeking a way of connecting with the Almighty, both trying to do the same thing. And they had different paths to get there, and that is okay, and that is, in fact, celebrated. Now, our Mishnah brings the dispute of the Academy of Shaman Hill as the example, as the prototype, of a dispute for the sake of heaven. Not only is a dispute okay, if you study what the dispute was like, you find that there was an intensity to it. There was virulence in the arguments of Shammai and Hillel and the academies of Shammai and Hillel. In fact, the Talmud tells us 
that true Torah scholars, when they are debating each other, all, of course, in pursuit of truth, they hate each other. Because they want to defend their position. I see it one way, you see it the other way, and we're going to duke it out. I'm not going to accept what you have to say. I think you're wrong. And if you walk into, if you're ever fortunate enough to walk into a base medrash, to a study hall in a yeshiva, you see something that you've never seen in your entire life. You'll see a sea of students, all of them screaming on top of their lungs. Something you've never seen before. And they're doing it for hours. I remember when I was in yeshiva, <laughs> I remember like I would, I would finish a, a session of study and like my, my voice would be hoarse. Like you've been screaming by a, by a football game or a soccer game, whatever they call it in England. And you're like, ah, I can't talk. And then you go back to war again the next day or the next, in that afternoon, the next session. That's the way it is. There's intensity. This is not, oh, let me present my opinion. Like the United Nations, everyone gets up and everyone claps nicely, politely. There is intensity to this. There's virulence to this. There's a, almost aggression to it. Talmud says the way to do it properly, it's not like a library. Everyone's quiet and respectful. The way to do it properly is the Torah scholars, when they are amidst the debate, they hate each other. But when they're done, they're the best friends. Because the people that you go to war with, the people that you're trying to find, the word of God, the truth of God, that's the goal. Those people are your closest friends forever. You're united in the pursuit of truth. So debate and disputation and argumentation, these are all celebrated in our world, but there's a way to do it. The way Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel did it, that is encouraged. They are all doing it for the sake of heaven. Now, our Mishnah tells us that the disputes for the sake of heaven will endure. So fully his time will be upheld, will endure. What exactly that means, there are a variety of interpretations in the commentaries. The simplest interpretation is that the people themselves will endure. What happened to Korach and his co-conspirators? They all died. They did not endure. The Almighty does not like, does not tolerate Disputes not for the sake of heaven. Disputes that are based upon selfish motivations. If you want to make a dispute and not suffer consequences, dire consequences as a result, you better make sure that your dispute is based upon the sake of heaven, not petty personal matters. Dispute is almost like a fire. And the fire can be a very good thing. It can be very constructive If you don't have fire, you don't have the modern economy, you don't have the modern world, you don't have good food, you don't have anything really without fire. But fire can also consume and destroy. So disputes like a fire. If it's a good kind of fire, it's very productive. Otherwise, if it's not for the sake of heaven, it will consume and destroy those who participate in it. Korach was swallowed. Korach Part of his group, they were smitten by fire. Dispute's very dangerous. When done, not for the sake of heaven. And there are many examples, unfortunately, in our people's history, of people having disputes, not for the sake of heaven, and suffering very grievous and dire consequences. It happens almost all the time. People have a dispute, and... It escalates and people die. It's just that simple. People do not endure if they have a dispute now for the sake of heaven. That's what Amisha says. They will not endure. And there's many, many such examples of people, let's say, a common example where it gets really public is if you have a yeshiva that goes through a succession crisis. So the head of the yeshiva passes and now who takes over? And there's a little bit of a, of a slugfest of a dispute, not for the sake of heaven, ever wants the power. In such an instance, those people have a very, very short lifespan. Unfortunately, they do not endure. In fact, if you look today at the largest 
and most prestigious yeshivos in the world, they are all the ones that did not have succession crises. They'd have disputes when the great leader passes. It was amicably resolved. There was no dispute. Those institutions indeed endure. I know my grandfather, he founded a yeshiva in a place called Be'er Yaakov. And there was a rumbling, shall we say, of a dispute, a dispute now for the sake of heaven. And he picked up his bags and he just walked away. He abdicated his throne. Not only did he start the yeshiva, he was the, you know, the, the titled owner of the buildings of the yeshiva. And he just walked away. He walked away. He forfeited it all. He didn't want to participate at all in a dispute now for the sake of heaven. And in fact, when he passed away about 22 years after he abandoned this yeshiva, he wrote in his last will and testament, the majority of the will was urging and coaxing his children not to contest the ownership of those buildings, even though they're worth millions of dollars, not to contest it, not to get involved in a dispute, not for the sake of heaven. So that's one interpretation of what it means to endure and not endure. To endure means to, to actually continually exist. But if you're involved in a dispute not for the sake of heaven, it's a very bad thing for your longevity. You may die early. It's not a good thing to do. There's another explanation of what it means that a dispute for the sake of heaven will endure. Will endure will eventually arrive at the goal. Shammai and Hillel disagreed. The academies of Shammai and Hillel disagreed. The Talmud tells us that they had a three-year dispute regarding who the halacha ought to follow. There were hundreds of disagreements between the academies of Shammai and Hillel, and they duked it out for three years. This is like uh, what we had in America, like a constitutional convention in 18 or 1787. The brightest minds got together, locked themselves in a room to figure out what's the best way to make a government. But this is not, you know, 50 smart people. Think of like the, you know, 10,000 most brightest people who've ever walked this planet locked up in a room 18 hours a day for three years having this disagreement. Now, we don't have the minutes of those disputes, but we do have the conclusion. After three years, they made no headway. The Academy of Hillel was still in favor of their position. The Academy of Shammai was still in favor of their position. And then a miracle happened. A prophetic voice boomed. Elu va'elu divrei elokim chaim. Both of you are right. Both of you are saying the truth. Both of you are saying Torah. Both of you are claiming the word of living God. However, the halacha follows Beis Hillel. The academy of Hillel is the halacha with a few exceptions. The academy of Hillel is correct vis-a-vis halacha, even though on a deep kind of philosophical and theological level, they're both saying the truth. And when they heard that prophetic voice, they had a resolution. The argument endured, meaning the goal was reached. They both wanted to arrive at the truth, and they both got what they wanted. The argument endured. The purpose of the argument was fulfilled. On a little bit of a deeper level, the Arizal tells us, that in heaven, the halacha follows the academy of Shammai. On earth, we follow the halacha, the halacha follows the academy of Hillel. But in heaven, the halacha follows the academy of Shammai. And in the future, what that means exactly is unclear, but I guess post the messianic era, the halacha will flip and we're going to follow the opinion of Beishamai, meaning even the opinion that gets discarded will endure. 
Even the opinion that is rejected, Beishamai, we don't consider them when it comes to the opinion of Beis Hillel, of the Academy of Hillel. We had a hundred year war between these two academies, and the Academy of Hillel won. But this dispute will endure, meaning the Academy of Shammai is still Torah, and in fact, in some future existence, in some future epic, the Academy of Shammai is indeed the Halacha. My grandfather was fond of sharing a novel interpretation of Rabbi Israel Salanter on this Mishnah. And he said that some people are so sure that what they're saying is just, is correct, is righteous. They're so positive about it. And therefore, they're willing to fight until the death to maintain their side. Meaning that there's like, he, he's flipping it on its head. That if you have a dispute and you're sure that you're doing God's will, you're convinced, you're deluded maybe, but you're convinced that this is what God wants me to do. Someone like that will never yield. The dispute will endure forever. We have to be very careful, says Rabbi Israel Salanter, to not have any disputes for the sake of heaven. Because if you're so sure that this is for the sake of heaven, yeah, I'm positive, I'm doing what's right. I'm fighting the good fight. Someone like that will never achieve equilibrium, will never yield, because they're convinced and they're deluded that this is for the sake of heaven. I'm a zealot. I'm a true fighter for a good cause, and I'll go dine with, I'll be a martyr for it. And that's very dangerous. Don't be such a person that fights the sake of heaven, meaning nothing gets through, no logic can penetrate, no reason can get through, because you are sure you are fighting for the sake of heaven. Such a dispute will endure forever, and that is a bad thing. But I think in general, the takeaway of this Mishnah is that arguments are good. It's a good thing, provided that you know how to do it. If you go to yeshiva, yeshiva is just all arguments. But it's not personal. It's not personal. I can tell you, I think you're a fool. I think you're an idiot. I can tell you that in the yeshiva. That's that's okay. Why? Because that's the way it works. We're trying to figure out what's the truth here. And you're saying nonsense. You know, when I left the yeshiva and moved to Houston and I kind of miss having good arguments, I really miss it because people today, like in the world at large, arguments get so personal. Everyone gets so offended. To me, it's not offensive at all. I'm so used to it. We, we did it for, for a decade, just arguing all day. And to me, I'm, I'm trying to argue for the truth. And if I'm wrong, okay, I'll yield. But if I think you're wrong, I'll tell you you're a fool. I won't actually do that because people think it's too seriously. But, you know, I love when I, I would give a lecture or give a talk, record a podcast, whatever it is. And then someone would say, Rabbi, you know, I don't want to offend you. Uh, I, I, and they're tiptoeing. They're tiptoeing. Well, well, maybe I disagree. Don't do that. Tell me, Rabbi, you got it wrong. That's what I want to hear. You're absolutely wrong and I can prove it. That's what I want to hear. Come on, come at me. Bring it at me. Come on, I'm ready for it. People are not accustomed to this kind of dispute. They're not accustomed to a dispute for the sake of heaven. It's not me attacking me. I'm trying to find the truth. You're trying to find the truth. We have different ways of seeing it. Let's duke it out. We don't take things personally. People today just don't know how to have a good argument. And that is very unfortunate. You know, people, political arguments are just so unproductive. Have you ever seen a political argument that one side said, you know what? You convinced me. I, I actually buy in. It's never like that. Why? Because it's not an argument for the sake of heaven. They're not arguing on the merits. It's kind of a tribal argument. And you have to support your side. We have to learn how to have a good fight. You pursue the truth. It's not personal. If you're wrong, no big deal. It's not painful for you to admit that you're wrong because you weren't, it wasn't you who was being debated. It was a position in pursuit of truth. It turns out that was wrong. So what? I have to make a right turn and not a left turn. Oh, I made a mistake. I made a right turn. Okay, that's fine. Or I made a left turn. I, 
I just adjust. No big deal. We're just trying to get to the destination. It's not personal at all. We're trying to align our brain with God's brain. That's what we get trained to do in yeshiva. That's exactly what we get trained to do. You have, you know, the Rashi commentary and you have the Tosos commentary and they disagree. And we're trying to figure out what is the grounds, what's the basis of the argument? What's underlying the disagreement? Why does Rachi say X and Tosfo says Y? And why do they disagree? What is actually going on over here? We're trying to kind of take apart the anatomy of the dispute. There's one position that's the underlying disagreement or difference between the two. And it gets manifested in the two different ways of seeing how the Talmud works. We're being trained to kind of approach the argument logically. What's actually at stake here? What is the disagreement? It's not personal. And then we have in, in, in the Talmud itself, one opinion of the Talmud, a second opinion of the Talmud. A question, an answer. What was the assumption underlying the question? And how was that assumption addressed? Was it, was it rejected? Is this particular example not a good example? Kind of learn to break things down. We learn the architecture of thinking. There's a question. Okay, what are the three assumptions of the question? A, B, and C. On which of these assumptions do we have any evidence? We try to kind of poke, poke and prod at the assumptions to find where the weakness is. This is all like logical and it's all in pursuit of truth. Arguments are okay. Individuality is encouraged. The idea of conformity and uniformity, and outsourcing your thinking to others, those are not Jewish ideals. But you have to know how to have an argument. And we're told the most important thing is the goal. Is the goal the sake of heaven? Because if it is, it will endure. Otherwise, it will not endure. That's how to have, how to have an argument. Both sides want the same goal. They just have different ways of getting there. Therefore, they could duke it out. They could argue. It's all okay. it's all okay. It's not personal. It will endure. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you want to have an argument with me? Send me an email and let's duke it out. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.